Hello, everybody. And, uh, you are welcome to season two of our lecture series, Statistics in Medical Research. Um, today, we are going to just uh, do a bit of an introduction to the whole concept of statistics and how it applies to medical research. Uh, my name is Greg Okobo, so let's just get right into it. Learning objectives for today's uh, particular lecture is going to be simple and straightforward. We want to be able to understand the fundamental concepts in medical and clinical research. Um, we should be able to identify types of medical and clinical research questions. And lastly, we should appreciate the role of biostatistics and statistics as a whole in medical and clinical research. Before we get right to it, let's look at medical research, or should I say research as a whole, what is research? So this is an organized and systematic way of finding answers to questions. And the key word there is questions. If we don't have a research question, then there is actually no scientific research. So research questions help us to drive the research efforts. And we try also to answer that question in an organized and in a systematic way. So this research has different um, areas, but today we want to narrow down a little bit to medical research. And this is simply research conducted to aid and support the body of knowledge in the field of medicine and public health. So medical research actually has a huge role to play in our care of um, patients, individuals, clients in um, the medical profession. So that is why we are focused on it today. Medical research actually has three different um, angles. The first is the type of research focusing on generating basic knowledge, which is what we refer to as basic research. And um, it deals with the very fundamentals, it generates knowledge. And those knowledge help us to um, uh, better our um, field of study, provided it is related to medicine. The second is the preclinical research, which is uh, research that is applied um, in the preclinical areas, not necessarily to patients per se, and uh, so in the areas of physiology, biochemistry, uh, or anatomy, all these are areas that deals with uh, the preclinical research, preclinical research area. And lastly, we have the clinical research area where we look at the patients, we look at care of the patients, and just to code in on that a little bit. So clinical research is any research related to apply to patient care. It could be in the prevention of disease, in the treatment of disease conditions, diagnostic or prognostic, or even in cost of managing any inquiry that has to do with um, all these different areas of clinical care that directly or indirectly relates to patients is clinical research area. It is the basis of evidence-based medicine. And evidence-based medicine is a, an area that has actually come to stay in the care of patients, whereby we care for every patient using evidence from published peer review literatures, evidence from the individual patient before us, and also a little bit of past experience. The idea, the whole concept is to reduce variability in the care of the patient such that we base our decision, our clinical decision or guidelines on published peer-reviewed um, research efforts. So that is why we are here today to understand what is clinical or medical research and how do we play a role in contributing to it and benefiting from it at the same time. So before we go deep into that, I want us to step back a little bit and try to understand what is the fundamental assumptions in research. What are we assuming? What is um, driving us? What is the background before we carry out a research? What is the fundamental assumptions? The fundamental assumption each time we carry out a research is simple. It simply is human diseases do not occur at random in a population. In other words, there is a pattern. And if we are able to identify that pattern, 
that means we can predict the variability. We can gain control of the various structure existing in that population with respect to that disease. And as such, we can use that knowledge to predict possible outcomes, cause of the disease, and all the other aspects of disease progression. So that is the key, the driving underlining fundamental principle in research and clinical research specifically is that human diseases do not occur at random in population. And it is, I have to code it on that random. I'm not saying haphazard as a difference. Random is actually you know, a well-defined standard term. It's not the same thing as haphazard. So we, 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 we believe that human disease do not occur at random in the population. There is a pattern and we can understand that pattern. We can understand the variation and knowledge of that variation can help us to explain causality and also the cause or the progression of the disease. So this is the fundamental assumption. This is why we are doing research, especially clinical research, to see how we can understand this fundamental assumptions, how we can um, work out these fundamental assumptions. So now we are in clinical research areas, or should I say clinical research question area. What is clinical research based on? Why are we doing this? What are the different areas that you can face as a clinician when you are carrying out the clinical research? No matter the question you are raising, no matter the studies you are conducting, usually it falls into one of these five areas. The diagnostic research question, etiologic research question, prognostic research question, intervention research question. And here, it can be intervention research with an intended effect in mind or intervention research with a side effect in mind. And this is very key because depending on what's your intervention, the outcome of your intervention research, that will determine a lot of the methodological approach that you need to use. And then lastly, we have the evaluation research. It looks at cost, effectiveness, and so on. So these are the areas that um, covers the, the different clinical research questions. And we are going to narrow down on each of them and till it out a little bit so that we can begin to understand the nitty gritty as well as the parachyma of clinical research development. And before we move into the next slide, look, there is a little um, a reference at the bottom, which is reporting guidelines. I encourage everybody to please go to the Equator Network and familiarize yourself with what is in there. There are a lot of guidelines that refers to these different areas, what they are, what are the checklists when you are writing the proposal in this area, and so on. So the Equator Network will help you um, to know what are the ingredients that should be present in any of these research um, areas when you are carrying out that study or developing a proposal or writing a paper for publication. So let's look at the different clinical research areas. The very first one there is a diagnostic research. And the aim of diagnostic research is to predict the likelihood of disease from clinical and non clinical profile of the patient. You have a patient who is at high risk of a disease. So how do I make my diagnosis? So any research question that deals with diagnosis or being able to use a procedure, a test or an investigation to diagnose a disease condition, that area is a diagnostic research area or diagnostic research question. And it is largely descriptive. And the kind of study uh, uh, data analysis that you do there is diagnostic accuracy measures sensitivity, specificity, receiver operating characteristic, curve, area under that, and, and so on. And even when you decide to carry out a regression analysis in a diagnostic research question area, it is aimed at looking for how much uh, of uh, predictors can you get to be able to diagnose 
uh, a particular disease condition or I can take it the other way. How few uh, predictors do you need to make a diagnosis of that particular condition? So regression, the intention of a regression analysis for a diagnostic research is quite specific and is even different from etiologic research as you will see now. So but the underlying principle here is that it's a diagnostic research question is a descriptive research, um, it's not an analytic research, and you use patients who are high risk for that particular condition so that you can predict the likelihood of this particular condition. The next is etiologic research. Here, we are interested in explaining the occurrence of a disease, giving some determinants, which we refer to as exposures, okay? This particular patient or group of patients have these um, exposures, how many, we come down with this condition, okay? Based on, you want to see the causal relationship. So I want to explain that. So anytime we are interested in explaining um, the occurrence of a disease, given some determinants, we are in the realm of etiologic research. And it is actually an analytic research. So all this we are going to explain in details in subsequent uh, lectures uh, series. Here, we are interested in measuring association, association between the exposure and the disease outcome, okay? So that measure of association will see little as we go down, what they are and how they are applied or calculated. And in this case here, if we should carry out um, a regression analysis here, the regression is not focused on looking at how many or how little uh, the number of predictors is for you to make a diagnosis. Here, it is interested in controlling for confounding variables. That's another term I just introduced, confounding variables. So we're also going to explain that in subsequent um, lecture uh, series as we move on. So this is actually the basic difference. So regression is not just a staged or model. You, it has to be driven by an intent. What is the goal? Why are you doing this? And uh, that is determined by the area of clinical research you are in. The third is the prognostic research. And here we are interested in predicting the cause of disease. This is quite different from diagnostic. Diagnosis is to predict the likelihood, but prognostic is to predict the cause of a disease from time T1 to time T2 in the future. And T1 may be period where you gave a drug to a cancer patient, and time T2 may be five years' time to see how many will have survived, or how many will have remission, how many will have readmission, reinfection, and so on. So each time you're interested in predicting the cause of a disease, then you are in the realm of a, a prognostic research uh, question. And it is also largely descriptive, just like diagnostic. So you don't have comparative group here and there. You just have a single group and you follow them up in time. And this kind of study, you may actually have a, a, a comparative group, but not in the sense of as an etiologic study. In this kind of study, what we are interested in, in terms of analysis is survival analysis. And also we look at the Kaplan-Meier uh, plot as well as the Cox proportional regression. So the Cox proportional regression here is not exactly the same as the earlier regression. Here, we're interested in the time to an event, looking at predictors of the time to when the, that particular T2 event will happen. And that's the beauty of the Cox regression analysis. So you see that the regression can draw its intent or its purpose, depending on the clinical research area. Then we have the intervention research, uh, which like I said before, has uh, but two intentions, but it combines, the beauty here is that it combines both etiologic and prognostic, prognostic research, combines them together. So in the intervention, you are giving a treatment to a group of patients, and you want to find out what the outcome will look like whether the outcome is an intended outcome or whether it is the side effect based on that treatment you have given. That is an intervention research area. 
uh, it combines both etiologic and prognostic. The etiologic aspect is the fact that we want to causally explain the cause of the disease as influenced by the treatment. How does the treatment we have given modulate or influence the cause of a disease? That is one area. Or the other area we're also interested in predicting the cause of the disease given the treatment. We can also predict if we give this treatment what will happen in the future. So it's not just the cause, explaining the cause of the disease, which is more like etiologic. We're also interested in pro prognostic predicting the cause of the disease. So that is the fine combination between etiologic and prognostic research. So each time you carry out an intervention study, this should be at the back of your mind, that you are explaining the cause of a disease given a treatment, and also you are predicting the cause of that same disease given the same treatment, okay? So it is both causal and descriptive. And the analysis we do, there's a combination of etiologic and prognostic analysis. Lastly is cost-effectiveness research question area. Uh, here we are interested in how cost-effective uh, an intervention could be or the cost-benefit of an intervention or even an operational research to look at um, a strategy that we have deployed in the population. So in that place, we do a lot of analysis. It's largely descriptive. And uh, what we do there is uh, we want to look at or evaluate uh, the strategy or want to look at the cost. So cost analysis is a different ball game in the realm of health economics. And I encourage us to at least have um, an idea of what is happening there and all the different analysis that is done there, including so many beautiful simulation uh, models and so on that goes on in cost analysis. So these are the five different areas of clinical research. Uh, just to go quickly, we brought up here some examples for us to have a rough idea of how clinical research area uh, research questions are presented in the literature. This is diagnostic research. I, I have to put these two here. Uh, looking at the first one, uh, this is a study that was uh, published uh, by Oluyemi Komo Lafer and uh, colleagues. And you can see that they are looking at C-reactive protein, procalcitonin, and lactic dehydrogenase for the diagnosis of pancreatic necrosis. So this paper is a good read. If you dive into it, it will help you to um, get the different methodology and dimensions of a diagnostic research. These are examples of prognostic studies that have also be carried out. And like I said before, there are a lot of survival analysis taking place here. Like the very first one carried out by Debi Francis Fabo Bibe and uh, Erabos Sunday in Debudia. They looked at survival analysis and prognostic factors of timing of first childbirth among women in Nigeria. Please, this is also a good read uh, article. And I want us to look at it and see how prognostic research uh, 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 pro producing research is, is carried out in terms of methodology, developing the research questions, and so on, and even presenting the, the data analysis. The other two also speak to different aspects of prognostic research. And remember, in this type of research, survival analysis is the key, kaplan meyer plot, as well as the Cox regression analysis. These are the etiologic uh, research publication. There are different types here. Look at the, uh, the last one. It's an association between glycemic status and thyroid dysfunction in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. This is a clear example of an etiologic study. Okay, And like I said before, in etiologic studies, we want to measure the association between the exposure and the outcome while controlling for other alternative explanations like a confounding variable. We want to make sure we control for them, okay? But the measures of association or based of effect that we normally use is the relative risk, the odd ratio, even sometimes the mean difference and so on. These are all measures of association that we use. And uh, these are actually scarce in, the, in literatures coming from Africa. We really don't measure association. We are just after testing association. There's a difference. Uh, 
testing association and getting p values is not the same thing as measuring association a research effort you really want to measure an association or measure an outcome and that should be the focus of research studies okay and the regression analysis here should be modeled to control for confounding variables in the theologic research intervention study like i said is a combination of both theologic and prognostic and these are examples of um, intervention studies i will encourage you to at least pick up one of them take a good look at it and then see how it can be useful to you moving forward okay and then the other uh, type of study is the cost or the evaluation study and these are examples a lot um, out there um, the third example here is the cost of open heart surgery in nigeria i think this uh um, good studies that will help us to have at least a good framework of what evaluative or cost analysis studies are all about. There are very technical um, analysis that goes in into cost analysis. So um, if this area is an area that we should look at and probably develop our skills in it. So these are the different areas, clinical research areas and uh, possible possibly where we can raise research questions. And as soon as you raise that research question, it determines what you can do. It determines the aim, it determines the, the, the study design, and even the type of analysis that you can do. And I encourage that we pay attention to our research question each time we want to carry out a medical or a clinical research. Um, that's for clinical research. Now, let's look at statistics. What does it have to do in medical research or what does it have to do with clinical research? Why should we be interested in statistics? Before we go in there, let's look at what is statistics. It has two definitions, okay? The first one is the science and the art of collecting, organizing, summarizing, analyzing, and making inferences from data. This is the singular definition. This actually is the definition that describes the field of study called statistics. Okay, and the key word there is data. If there is no data collected, then there is no statistics. So data collected evokes statistics. So we want to use statistics to understand data, to bring out meaning from data that we have collected. And if you agree with me, medicine, uh, clinic, clinical uh, research, public health, biomedical research, these are areas that generate a lot of data, big data. So statistics is a handy tool for every one of us, okay? Uh, but the other definition still exists, and uh, this is called the plural definition, where statistics now refers to a numerical quantity that we compute from a sample. So the key word there is a sample, sample data. So if you have a sample data and you summarize that sample data using just one um, number, that number automatically is referred to as a statistic. So if I have a set of data and I look for the mean, you know, the mean will turn out to be just one number that summarizes or describes the other, the, the other uh, element of values or the data set as a whole. So that mean, that single value is referred to as a statistic. The median is referred to as a statistic. The mode is referred to as a statistic. Even the standard deviation, anything that describes, any single value that describes a sample data, the keyword is sample, it must be a sample, then it's that single data is also referred to as a statistic, okay? So the sample mean is a statistic. So that is called the plural definition. So you now see that statistics as used in literatures can be two things. It can be the field of study, or it can be the characteristic of a sample, okay? There are um, two main as um, um, arm of statistics. The first part is called the mathematical statistics, where we are really interested in coming out with theories and uh, proofs that generate statistical knowledge. The other arm, which is the applied, is where we take that knowledge generated and apply to a given field of study. So if that given field of study is in medicine, public health, or biology, it's referred to as biostatistics, okay? 
There are other areas. If it's in economics, it's called econometrics, even agrometrics. There are so many areas. Okay, there are there's even genetic statistics. So if you apply the knowledge gained from mathematical statistics to a given field of study, it's referred to as uh, 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 it, it, it assumes the name of that area. So for us in medicine, in public health, in uh, biology or biomedical researchers, that now comes to biostatistics. Okay, so most times the bio aspect is easily understood by every one of us. The problem usually is the statistics aspect. So, so biostatistics, we may understand the bio, but we have problem with the statistics. So this series of lectures is to help us bridge that connection. How do we use statistics to gain intelligence into our biological, medical, or public health data? That is the aim. That is why we are doing this particular lecture series. Um, so narrow down into about statistics and even generally statistics as a whole, there are two method approaches to biostatistics or statistics as a whole. First is descriptive, the other arm is inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics on one hand attempt to summarize data set that we have measured from a sample summarizes data sets that we have measured from a given sample. So, and depending on the type of data sets, which can be categorical or numerical, then different tools of statistics can come up. Measures of location, measures of dispersion, measures of shape, which we use for numerical data, or measures of frequency or association, which we use for categorized data. So we are going to look deep into the meaning of what is categorical data, what is the what is data, what is variable in the next lecture, which is the season two lecture two. So you have to um, make sure you subscribe to this channel and make sure the notification button is clicked so that you get a notification each time we put up any lecture. So please. Uh, just look out for that. What is data? What is variable? And other terms that we use in statistics will be explained later. The other arm is inferential statistics, which has two arms test of hypothesis that largely deals with p value, and then estimation method that largely deals with confidence intervals. So, p values is test of hypothesis, confidence interval is estimation method. That's a very simplified way to remember the two arms of inferential statistics. But indeed, what does inference they say? What does it do? What is the big idea? Why are we interested in inference statistics? What is p value? Why are we interested in that? Okay, so we're going to look at that in the next two slides. But what is most important here is the role of statistics in medical research. That role. Statistics can play actually two roles. It can help us to improve our practice. And how? Remember, we are in evidence-based medicine. So your ability to read and understand published literatures is key so that you understand what the data is saying from your peers that has published different aspects of your patient care. So if you want to improve your practice, then you really, really need to understand statistics. So that is one. The other one is statistics help us to carry out our own research. And statistics evades every aspect of our research starting from conceptualizing to planning, design, even execution of data. Remember the key term here is data. You need to collect data that is valid to answer your research question. Statistics will help you to collect that data validly. So it helps you to critically think through your research question, conceptualize your research question, identify the different variables you have going to be manipulated. And that helps you to ensure that your data is valid. And then as soon as you have your data, it helps you to also process the data, analyze the data, present the data, interpret data, and even how to publish the data. So this thing is like um, the lifeblood of, of research, scientific research. You can't just avoid it, no matter your discipline. So that is the role of statistics in medical research. So like I said earlier, what is the issue with inferential statistics and descriptive statistics? Why are we interested in it? So I've come up with this concept of the big idea, the big idea in research and how biostatistics helps us to anchor that big idea firmly in our minds. So anytime we want to carry out a research, our research question is always about a population. 
always about a population. So we are interested in looking out for the mean age of our patients that we see. Okay, that mean age is the mean age of patients that will ever come to us, that has ever come to us, and that will come to us. So it's a large population. It's huge. But you can't have access to all those categories I just explained now, okay? So usually we pick a sample and we use a random procedure to pick that sample. What that simply means is that we allow chance to pick the sample so that we are not biased. We don't allow our preferences to select patient for us because this sample that we want to use to gain knowledge of this population must represent this population. So put it in a different way. Anytime we carry out a research, the sample that we use to get the data is actually a means to an end. We collect the sample so that it can help us to get knowledge of the population. That is why you see, we don't conclude on the sample. We conclude on the population because that is where our research question lies, the population. We want to get knowledge about the population, but because of efficiency, purpose, cost, and time, we need to pick a sample. So, and we need to pick that sample using a random procedure. And then, given that sample, we now measure the variables that will help us to answer that research question. So, as soon as we measure those variables, we get data. So, how do we analyze data statistics? which are descriptive statistics. So descriptive statistics help us to describe the data we obtain from sample. And remember the sample is only a means to an end, it's not the end. So we need to describe the sample first so that it will help us to gain knowledge about the population, okay? So that sample will help us to measure outcomes, measure predictors in, that, uh, in, in our research effort or measure associations. But that is just referring to the sample. Whatever we get when we carry out descriptive statistics is of the sample. So how do we link what we have gotten back to the population of which we want to make conclusion? The population where we raise our research question, that is now the role of inferential statistics. So inferential statistics help us to link whatever findings we have from the sample back to the population. And it at the same time help us to quantify all sorts of uh, variations and sometimes um, um, all sorts of uh, things that we have that want to maybe uh, distort the outcome of interest. So that is the role of inferential statistics to link the sample back to the population so that we can make our conclusions. And we statisticians have developed two ways to do that: like test of hypothesis, which accounts for the role of chance as measured by the p-value or the probability value. And the other method or approach is the estimation method, which accounts for um, um, the, how precise our measurement is, how precise that measurement is, and it uses confidence interval. Usually in clinical research, we always want to promote confidence interval. Uh, but that does not mean that p-value does not have a role but we want to promote confidence intervals. So if you're a medical researcher or a clinical researcher, you need to really understand what is estimation method, what is confidence interval, and how do you interpret it? And along this lecture series, there is a, series, there is a lecture that focuses on confidence interval and p-value. So I'll encourage you to stay tuned. But this is the big idea. Remember, a sample is only a means to an end. Our conclusion is on the population. Descriptive statistics help us to describe the data from our sample and differential links that um, description or those estimates back to the population so that we can make conclusion. So this is the big idea. This is the reason why we carry out research and this is the underlying principles and the role of statistics in research. So um, lastly, you know, uh, especially if, when we are carrying out either etiologic or intervention studies, so most times we are interested in causality. Okay, how does this exposure lead to this outcome? That is the most times we are interested in that because understanding that, understanding the randomness and establishing that randomness, how manipulation of an exposure can lead to an outcome 
is key for us to manage a patient that is before us. So we want to establish randomness. We want to find out the uh, issue of cause and effect, causality. How does this exposure lead to this outcome? So anytime you carry out um, a research, you must remember that there is a difference between an association and a causation. Whatever you get from your sample, at that point, it is still an association. The summary statistics, the uh, outcome measures, whether it's the mean age, whether it's the relative risk odd ratio, they are all observed outcomes. They are still an association. They don't tell you much about causation. For you to move from an observed outcome to causation, you must, must take care of these four things which we refer to as alternative um, alternative causes of an association or alternative reasons for an observed an association. You must account for the role of chance in that observed outcome. And to account for the role of chance or random error, we use the test of hypothesis, the p-value. You must also ensure that it is free from bias, which is the errors brought in by the investigation the investigator. That is why Methodology, methodological rigorousness is key each time you carry out your research. You must also account for confounding, especially if you are carrying out an etiologic study or an intervention study. And lastly, you must account for reverse causality, in other words, which came first, the egg or the chicken, okay? Or arthritis or weight gain, which came first? Could it be the opposite? Does arthritis lead to weight gain? or weight gain leads to arthritis, which came first. You must be able to reverse causality. You must be able to ensure you establish temporality, time sequence, what came first. What came first. It's only when you're able to account for these alternative explanations of an observed outcome that we say our outcome is actually a valid association. If your association is not valid, you cannot talk of causality or causation. And it's not even enough to have a valid outcome. You must also consider what we refer to as the Bradford Hills criteria. There are other criteria, but Bradford Hill is the most notable. It's had like a set of guidelines that you must meditate over before you can say a valid association is causal. Things like specificity, temporality, consistency, biological plausibility, experimentation, and so on. You need to go through. So the Bradford Hill criteria is one of the things that we also go through, so that we get a deep understanding of how we link a valid association to causation and how an observed outcome becomes valid. Okay, if you are able to do this and take care of uh, the alternative explanations and you pass your value association through the Bradford Hughes criteria or guidelines, then you can't make um, conclusions about causality in a given population. So statistics is not enough. That's what I'm saying. You need to also go through these stages before you can declare causation or a causal association between an exposure and an outcome. So at this point, I want to say thank you for listening. Please stay tuned for lecture two in season two of Statistics and Medical Research. Bye and have a great day.